There were two white men in charge of the trading station. Kaertz, the chief, was short and fat. Carlier, the assistant, was tall, with a large head and a very broad trunk, perched upon a long pair of thin legs. The third man on the staff was a Sierra Leone nigger, who maintained that his name was Henry Price. However, for some reason or other, the natives down the river had given him the name of Makola, and it stuck to him through all his wanderings about the country. He spoke English and French with a warbling accent, wrote a beautiful hand, understood bookkeeping, and cherished in his innermost heart the worship of evil spirits. His wife was a negress from Loanda, very large and very noisy. Three children rolled about in sunshine before the door of his low, shed-like dwelling. Macola despised the two white men. He had charge of a small clay storehouse with a dried grass roof and pretended to keep a correct account of beads, cotton cloth, red kerchiefs, brass wire, and other trade goods it contained. Besides the storehouse and McCullough's hut, there was only one large building in the cleared ground of the station. It was built neatly of reeds, with a veranda on all the four sides. There were three rooms in it. The one in the middle was the living room, and had two rough tables and a few stools in it. The other two were the bedrooms for the white men. Each had a bedstead and a mosquito net for all furniture. The plank floor was littered with the belongings of the white men. Open half-empty boxes, torn wearing apparel, old boots, all the things dirty and all the things broken that accumulate mysteriously round untidy men. There was also another dwelling place some distance away from the buildings. In it, under a tall cross, much out of the perpendicular, slept the man who had seen the beginning of all this, who had planned and had watched the construction of this outpost of progress. He had been, at home, an unsuccessful painter, who, weary of pursuing fame on an empty stomach, had gone out there through high protections. He had been the first chief of that station. McCullough had watched the energetic artist die of fever in the just-finished house with his usual kind of I told you so, indifference. Then, for a time, he dwelt alone with his family, his account books, and the evil spirit that rules the land under the equator. He got on very well with his god. Perhaps he had propitiated him by a promise of more white men to play with by and by. At any rate, the director of the great trading company coming up in a steamer that resembled an enormous sardine box with a flat roof shed erected on it, found the station in good order, and Macola, as usual, quietly diligent. The director had the cross put up over the first agent's grave, and appointed Kaertz to the post. Carlier was told off as second in charge. The director was a man ruthless and efficient, who at times, but very imperceptibly, indulged in grim humor. He made a speech to Kaertz and Carlier, pointing out to them the promising aspect of their station. The nearest trading post was about 300 miles away. It was an exceptional opportunity for them to distinguish themselves and to earn percentages on the trade. This appointment was a favor done to beginners. Kaertz was moved, almost to tears, by his director's kindness. He would, he said, by doing his best, try to justify the flattering confidence, etc., etc. Kaertz had been in the administration of the telegraphs, 
and knew how to express himself correctly. Carlier, an ex-non-commissioned officer of cavalry in an army guaranteed from harm by several European powers, was less impressed. If there were commissions to get, so much the better, and trailing a sulky glance over the river, the forests, the impenetrable bush that seemed to cut off the station from the rest of the world, he muttered between his teeth, We shall see very soon. Next day, some bales of cotton goods and a few cases of provisions having been thrown on shore, the sardine box steamer went off, not to return for another six months. On the deck, the director touched his cap to the two agents, who stood on the bank, waving their hats, and turning to an old servant of the company, on his passage to headquarters, said, Look at those two imbeciles. They must be mad at home to send me such specimens. I told those fellows to plant a vegetable garden, build new storehouses and fences, and construct a landing stage. I bet nothing will be done. They won't know how to begin. I always thought the station on this river useless, and they just fit that station. They will form themselves there, said the old stager, with a quiet smile. At any rate, I am rid of them for six months, retorted the director. The two men watched the steamer round the bend, then, ascending arm in arm, the slope of the bank returned to the station. They had been in this vast and dark country only a very short time, and as yet always in the midst of other white men, under the eye and guidance of their superiors. And now, dull as they were to the subtle influences of surroundings, they felt themselves very much alone, when suddenly left unassisted to face the wilderness, a wilderness rendered more strange, more incomprehensible by the mysterious glimpses of the vigorous life it contained. There were two perfectly insignificant and incapable individuals, whose existence is only rendered possible through the high organization of civilized crowds. Few men realize that their life, the very essence of their character, their capabilities, and their audacities, are only the expression of their belief in the safety of their surroundings, the courage, the composure, the confidence, the emotions and principles. Every great and every insignificant thought belongs not to the individual, but to the crowd, to the crowd that believes blindly in the irresistible force of its institutions and of its morals, and the power of its police and of its opinion. But the contact with pure, unmitigated savagery, with primitive nature and primitive man, brings sudden and profound trouble into the heart, to the sentiment of being alone of one's kind, to the clear perception of the loneliness of one's thoughts, of one's sensations, to the negation of the habitual, which is safe, there is added the affirmation of the unusual, which is dangerous, a suggestion of things vague uncontrollable and repulsive, whose discomposing intrusion excites the imagination and tries the civilized nerves of the foolish and the wise alike. Kayertz and Carlier walked arm in arm, drawing close to one another as children do in the dark, and they had the same, not altogether unpleasant, sense of danger which one half suspects to be imaginary. They chatted persistently in familiar tones. Our station is prettily situated, said one. The other assented with enthusiasm, enlarging volubly on the beauties of the situation. Then they passed near the grave. Poor devil, said Kayertz. He died of fever, didn't he? muttered Carlier, stopping short. 
Why, retorted K. Hertz with indignation, I have been told that the fellow exposed himself recklessly to the sun. The climate here, everybody says, is not at all worse than at home, and as long as you keep out of the sun... Do you hear that, Carlier? I am chief here, and my orders are that you should not expose yourself to the sun. He assumed his superiority jocularly, but his meaning was serious. The idea that he would, perhaps, have to bury Carlier and remain alone gave him an inward shiver. He felt suddenly that this Carlier was more precious to him here in the center of Africa than a brother could be anywhere else. Carlier, entering into the spirit of the thing, made a military salute and answered in a brisk tone, Your orders shall be attended to, chief. Then he burst out laughing, slapped K. Ertz on the back and shouted, We shall let life run easily here. Just sit still and gather in the ivory those savages will bring. This country has its good points, after all. They both laughed loudly while Carlier thought, That poor K. Ertz, he is so fat and unhealthy. It would be awful if I had to bury him here. He is a man I respect. Before they reached the veranda of their house, they called one another, My dear fellow. The first day they were very active pottering about with hammers and nails and red calico to put up curtains, make their house habitable and pretty, resolved to settle down comfortably to their new life. For them, an impossible task, to grapple effectually with even purely material problems requires more serenity of mind and more lofty courage than people generally imagine. No two beings could have been more unfitted for such a struggle. Society, not from any tenderness, but because of its strange needs, had taken care of those two men, forbidding them all independent thought, all initiative, all departure from routine, and forbidding it under pain of death. They could only live on condition of being machines. And now, released from the fostering care of men with pens behind the ears or of men with gold lace on the sleeves they were like those lifelong prisoners who liberated after many years do not know what use to make of their freedom they did not know what use to make of their faculties being both through want of practice incapable of independent thought at the end of two months, K. Ertz often would say, If it was not for my Melly, you wouldn't catch me here. Melly was his daughter. He had thrown up his post in the administration of the telegraphs, though he had been for seventeen years perfectly happy there, to earn a dowry for his girl. His wife was dead, and the child was being brought up by his sisters. He regretted the streets, the pavements, the cafes, his friends of many years, all the things he used to see, day after day, all the thoughts suggested by familiar things, the thoughts effortless, monotonous, and soothing of a government clerk. He regretted all the gossip, the small enmities, the mild venom, and the little jokes of government offices. If I had had a decent brother-in-law. Carlier would remark, a fellow with a heart, I would not be here. He had left the army and had made himself so obnoxious to his family by his laziness and impudence that an exasperated brother-in-law had made superhuman efforts to procure him an appointment in the company as a second-class agent, having not a penny in the world, he was compelled to accept this means of livelihood as soon as it became quite clear to him that there was nothing more to squeeze out of his relations. 
He, like K. Ertz, regretted his old life. He regretted the clink of saber and spurs on a fine afternoon, the barrack room witticisms, the girls of garrison towns. But besides, he had also a sense of grievance. He was evidently a much ill-used man. This made him moody at times. But the two men got on well together in the fellowship of their stupidity and laziness. Together they did nothing, absolutely nothing, and enjoyed the sense of the idleness for which they were paid. And in time they came to feel something resembling affection for one another. They lived like blind men in a large room aware only of what came in contact with them, and of that only imperfectly, but unable to see the general aspect of things. The river, the forest, all the great land throbbing with life were like a great emptiness. Even the brilliant sunshine disclosed nothing intelligible. Things appeared and disappeared before their eyes in an unconnected and aimless kind of way. The river seemed to come from nowhere and flow no whither. It flowed through a void. Out of that void at times came canoes, and men with spears in their hands would suddenly crowd the yard of the station. They were naked, glossy, black, ornamented with snowy shells and glistening brass wire perfect of limb. They made an uncouth babbling noise when they spoke, moved in a stately manner, and sent quick, wild glances out of their startled, never-resting eyes. Those warriors would squat in long rows, four or more deep, before the veranda, while their chiefs bargained for hours with Makola over an elephant tusk. Kehrt sat on his chair and looked down on the proceedings, understanding nothing. He stared at them with his round blue eyes, called out to Carlier, Here, look, look at that fellow there, and that other one, to the left. Did you ever see such a face? Oh, the funny brute. Carlier, smoking native tobacco in a short wooden pipe, would swagger up twirling his mustaches and surveying the warriors with a haughty indulgence, would say, Fine animals. Brought any bone? Yes. It's not any too soon. Look at the muscles of that fellow, third from the end. I wouldn't care to get a punch on the nose from him. Fine arms, but legs no good below the knee. Couldn't make cavalrymen of them and after glancing down complacently at his own shanks, he always concluded, Pah! Don't they stink! You, Macola, take that herd over to the fetish. The storehouse was in every station called the fetish, perhaps because of the spirit of civilization it contained, and give them up some of the rubbish you keep there. I'd rather see it full of bone than full of rags. Kehrts approved. Yes, yes, go and finish that palaver over there, Mr. McCullough. I will come round when you are ready to weigh the tusk. We must be careful. Then turning to his companion, This is the tribe that lives down the river. They are rather aromatic. I remember they had been once before here. Did you hear that row? What a fellow has got to put up with in this dog of a country. My head is split. Such profitable visits were rare. For two days the pioneers of trade and progress would look on their empty courtyard in the vibrating brilliance of vertical sunshine. Below the high bank the silent river flowed on glittering and steady. On the sands, in the middle of the stream, hippos and alligators sunned themselves side by side, and stretching away in all directions, 
surrounding the insignificant cleared spot of the trading post, immense forests, hiding fateful complications of fantastic life, lay in the elegant silence of mute greatness. The two men understood nothing, cared for nothing, but for the passage of days that separated them from the steamer's return. Their predecessor had left some torn books. They took up these wrecks of novels, and, as they had never read anything of the kind before, they were surprised and amused. Then, during the long days, there were interminable and silly discussions about plots and personages. In the center of Africa, they made acquaintances with Richelieu and of D'Artagnan, and of many other people. All these imaginary personages became subjects for gossip, as if they had been living friends. They discounted their virtues, suspected their motives, decried their successes, were scandalized at their duplicity, or were doubtful about their courage. The accounts of crime filled them with indignation, while tender or pathetic passages moved them deeply. Carlier cleared his throat and said in a soldierly voice, What nonsense! Kaertz, his round eyes suffused with tears, his fat cheeks quivering, rubbed his bald head and declared, This is a splendid book. I had no idea there were such clever fellows in the world. They also found some old copies of a home paper. That print discussed what it was pleased to call our colonial expansion in high-flown language. It spoke much of the rights and duties of civilization, of the sacredness of the civilizing work, and extolled the merits of those who went about bringing light and faith and commerce to the dark places of the earth. Carlier and Kayertz read, wondered, and began to think better of themselves. Carlier said one evening, waving his hand about, In a hundred years there will be perhaps a town here, quays and warehouses and barracks and, and billiard rooms. Civilization, my boy, and virtue, and all. And then chaps will read that two good fellows, K. Ertz and Carlier, were the first civilized men to live in this very spot. K. Ertz nodded. Yes, it is a consolation to think of that. They seemed to forget their dead predecessor. But early one day, Carlier went out and replanted the cross firmly. It used to make me squint whenever I walked that way, he explained to Kayertz over the morning coffee. It made me squint, leaning over so much. So I just planted it upright. And solid, I promise you. I suspended myself with both hands to the cross piece, not a move. Oh, I did that properly. At times, Gobilia came to see them. Gobilia was the chief of the neighboring villages. He was a gray-headed savage, thin and black, with a white cloth around his loins and a mangy panther skin hanging over his back. He came up with long strides of his skeleton legs, swinging a staff as tall as himself, and entering the common room of the station, would squat on his heels to the left of the door. There he sat, watching Kayertz, and now and then making a speech which the other did not understand. Kayertz, without interrupting his occupation, would from time to time say in a friendly manner, how goes it, you old image? And they would smile at one another. The two whites had a liking for that old and incomprehensible creature, 
and called him Father Gobilla. Gobilla's manner was paternal, and he seemed really to love all white men. They all appeared to him very young, indistinguishably alike, except for stature, and he knew that they were all brothers, and also immortal. The death of the artist, who was the first white man whom he knew intimately, did not disturb this belief, because he was firmly convinced that the white stranger had pretended to die and got himself buried for some mysterious purpose of his own, into which it was useless to inquire. Perhaps it was his way of going home to his own country. At any rate, there were his brothers, and he transferred his absurd affection to them. They returned it in a way. Carlier slapped him on the back and recklessly struck off matches for his amusement. Kayertz was always ready to let him have a sniff at the ammonia bottle. In short, they behaved just like that other white creature that hid itself in a hole in the ground. Gobila considered them attentively. Perhaps they were the same being with the other, or one of them was. He couldn't decide, clear up that mystery, but he remained always very friendly. In consequence of that friendship, the women of Gobilia's village walked in single file through the reedy grass, bringing every morning to the station fowls and sweet potatoes and palm wine, and sometimes a goat. The company never provisions the stations fully, and the agents require those local supplies to live. They had them through the goodwill of Gobilia, and lived well. Now and then, one of them had a bout of fever, and the other nursed him with gentle devotion. They did not think much of it. It left them weaker, and their appearance changed for the worse. Carlier was hollow-eyed and irritable. Kayertz showed a drawn, flabby face above the rotundity of his stomach, which gave him a weird aspect. But being constantly together, they did not notice the change that took place gradually in their appearance and also in their dispositions. Five months passed in that way. Then one morning, as Kayertz and Carlier, lounging in their chairs under the veranda, talked about the approaching visit of the steamer, a knot of armed men came out of the forest and advanced towards the station. They were strangers to that part of the country. They were tall, slight, draped classically from neck to heel in blue-fringed cloths, and carried percussion muskets over their bare right shoulders. Makola showed signs of excitement and ran out of the storehouse where he spent all his days to meet these visitors. They came into the courtyard and looked about them with steady, scornful glances. Their leader, a powerful and determined-looking negro with bloodshot eyes, stood in front of the veranda and made a long speech. He gesticulated much and ceased very suddenly. There was something in his intonation and the sounds of the long sentences he used that startled the two whites. It was like a reminiscing of something not exactly familiar and yet resembling the speech of civilized men. It sounded like one of those impossible languages which sometimes we hear in our dreams. What lingo is that? said the amazed Carlier. In the first moment I fancied the fellow was going to speak French. Anyway, it is a different kind of gibberish of what we never heard. Yes, replied Kayertz. Hey, Bacola, what does he say? Where do they come from? Who are they? But Makola, who seemed to be 
standing on hot bricks, answered hurriedly, I don't know, they come from very far. Perhaps Mrs. Price will understand. They are perhaps bad men. The leader, after waiting for a while, said something sharply to McCullough, who shook his head. Then the man, after looking round, noticed McCullough's hut and walked over there. The next moment, Mrs. McCullough was heard speaking with great volubility. The other strangers, they were six in all, strode about with an air of ease, put their heads through the door of the storeroom, congregated round the grave, pointed understandingly at the cross, and generally made themselves at home. I don't like those chaps, and I say, Kayerts, they must be from the coast. They've got firearms, observed the sagacious Carlier. Kayerts also did not like those chaps. They both, for the first time, became aware that they lived in conditions where the unusual may be dangerous and that there was no power on earth outside of themselves to stand between them and the unusual. They became uneasy, went in and loaded their revolvers. Kayert said we must order Macola to tell them to go away before dark. The strangers left in the afternoon after eating a meal prepared for them by Mrs. Macola. The immense woman was excited and talked much with the visitors. She rattled away shrilly, pointing here and there at the forests and the river. Macola sat apart and watched. At times he got up and whispered to his wife. He accompanied the strangers across the ravine at the back of the station ground and returned slowly, looking very thoughtful. When questioned by the white men, he was very strange seemed not to understand, seemed to have forgotten French, seemed to have forgotten how to speak altogether. Kayerts and Carlier agreed that the nigger had had too much palm wine. There was some talk about keeping a watch in turn, but in the evening everything seemed so quiet and peaceful that they retired as usual. All night they were disturbed by a lot of drumming in the villages. A deep, rapid roll nearby would be followed by another far off. Then all ceased. Soon short appeals would rattle here and there. Then all mingled together, increase, become vigorous and sustained, would spread out over the forest through the night, unbroken and ceaseless, near and far as if the whole land had been one immense drum booming out steadily an appeal to heaven, and through the deep and tremendous noise sudden yells that resembled snatches of songs from a madhouse darted shrill and high in discordant jets of sound which seemed to rush far above the earth and drive all peace from under the stars. Carlier and Kayerts slept badly. They both thought they had heard shots fired during the night, but they could not agree as to the direction. In the morning, Macola was gone somewhere. He returned about noon with one of yesterday's strangers and eluded all Kayert's attempts to close with him. Had become deaf, apparently. Kayert's wondered. Carlier, who had been fishing off the bank, came back and remarked he showed his catch. The nigger seemed to be in a deuce of a stir. I wonder what's up. I saw about fifteen canoes cross the river during the two hours I was there fishing. Kayert's, worried, said, Isn't this Macola very queer today? Carlier advised, Keep all our men together in case of some trouble. 